All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. We have a uh, special visitor uh, this morning to uh, bring us some insight and uh, perspectives. Um, before we get started, uh, quick housekeeping. Um, the CME color for today is going to be gold in honor of uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And then um, looks like this room is actually going to be occupied at eight. So we're going to, uh, after this lecture is over, um, all the residents, we're going to do a sh uh, short little hot seat session and chat with uh, Dr. Taylor a bit. Um, we're going to go up to the MSKI boardroom. Um, so after we're done in here, that'll give us our uh, five minutes of uh, leg stretching to head upstairs. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, Dr. Mormon has a couple of uh, important announcements for all of us, and then we'll ask uh, Dr. Bates to uh, introduce our uh, patron speaker this morning. Thanks, Josh. Um, so we had the ORF Regional Residence Symposia last Friday that were, was co-hosted by us and Dr. Komen and the Wake Forest team. And um, it, was, it was a great program. I want to thank um, Rachel Seymour and Carrie Danielson for doing a fantastic job of getting that together. And all the detail was perfect. They did a great job. We had Dr. Rasu Sresla, who's our Chief Innovation Officer, who gave a presentation on the Pearl, an innovation district that's coming, focusing on ERCAD. So um, we're all excited about ERCAD. That's going to be a simulation center here, Erica, that'll be um, really second to none. It's based out of Strasbourg, and we're really excited to get that going. I also wanted to, um, to mention that um, we had a real good showing of our residents. We had seven papers accepted, five presented, and we actually had three award winners. So I wanted to acknowledge our, our award winners. Um, first, um, we had a tie for third place uh, between Julia Mastracci and Elaine Ching. And Julia presented her, her work on tibial non-union exchange nailing, which fails more than one third of the time. It's very well presented. So Elaine, Elaine did a great job. I'm sorry, Julia did a great job, as did Elaine. And Lane presented on health literacy awareness amongst orthopedic surgery residents. So congratulations to Elaine and to um, Julia for, for getting the awards. And then we had a second place winner, um, Samuel Cohen Tanugi. And um, Sam, you weren't there to get your award. Um, Elaine accepted it for you. So we're gonna have to Photoshop your, your face on her body for the picture. But um, congratulations on your second place award. So that it was a really good showing. A lot of fun too, and, and good to interact with the other residents. We had residents from as far away as West Virginia and, and Georgia. So um, people came from, from all the major institutions. And I think there were 21 papers presented. So it was really good, good showing by our team. Um, another announcement I want to make that's even more exciting is that we just got our results from the boards and all of our residents taking part two and part one passed. So another 100% pass rate. So really proud of the residents. I'm also grateful for our great education program led by Josh Pat as our vice chair of education, our program director, Brian Scannell, associate program directors, um, Natty Hammond and, and Larry Kempton, and then the GME team, Susan, Hannah, and Helen. So we got great support for our residents, but really proud of, of the effort um, and getting through the boards. So that's really reflecting well on the program. Here. So Michael, I think it's um, your turn to introduce our guest. So uh, good morning, everyone. It is really an honor to be able to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, Dr. Taylor and I go back to University of Virginia where she was an orthopedic surgery resident when I was in medical school. And since that time has really gone on to develop a successful hand practice at Duke University has also turned into be quite the national leader in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Uh, in addition to running a practice, becoming a national leader, doing talks all over the country, she's also the mom of four kids and manages to do all of this. So we really thank her for making the time to make the trip down to Charlotte. So we have asked her to come give us some of the insight on the progress they have made at Duke University. They're really, um, when it comes to the patient experience, when it comes to educational realm, uh, recruiting fellows and residents, they've done some really intriguing things. And I think there's a lot that we could stand to learn from their experience. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for making the trip down. So good morning. Um, I've been told I'm gonna stand right here which 
goes against everything I stand for. So I like to walk when I talk. I use my hands if you haven't noticed already. Um, but if you see me sort of shaking and trembling, it's because this is you know really constraining. But um, I want to first thank you all for showing up. I understand there's a hybrid option. This topic is super difficult at baseline and to do it without seeing faces, expressions, responses, connecting as humans, it's even more challenging. So thank you for being here in person. Those who are logged in, I um, hope to meet you one day. But I give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Michael Bates for pioneering everything that I've heard is going on with Ortho Carolina. I spent yesterday with the Atrium uh, Women's Leadership Conference and met almost 300 phenomenal women leaders from this area and beyond. Many of you in this audience were mentioned. I had, had so many tell so-and-so I said hi, tell Dr. Cohen I said hi, tell Dr. Mormon I said hello. I, I honestly cannot remember all of the names, but everyone says hello to all of you. Special thanks to Dr. Cohen as well as Dr. Pat, Dr. Scandal, and of course, my longtime colleague, mentor, and now uh, friend, Dr. Mormon. So thank you for having me here. And then a special um, note of gratitude to my not only named twin, but a dear friend of mine, Dr. Erica Gann. Um, we have patients who think they've only seen one person, but they've actually seen both of us. <laughs> so I want to start, um, because we didn't get the chance to spend time together, before I dive into something that can be very charged, sensitive, controversial, and really thought provoking, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. And so I won't read these things to you, but I am probably the only 41 year old who still puts her high school on her CV. I am proud to be a graduate of Thomas Jefferson High School of Science Technology. Our tagline was, we came for the sports. Um, but all of these things, if you look at it, you see this sense of, well, clearly I bounced back and forth between two institutions. I made a beeline to the Midwestern Fellowship. I will never do that again. Quickly came back to work at Duke. This is my 10th year of practice. I work at Duke Raleigh Hospital, which is considered the community, the fastest growing county in the state actually. Um, and so I'm what's considered a community Duke doctor, but still I'm very involved and engaged with the academic portion and of course leadership. Despite these things, the two most influential people that I'll talk to you about now, that's what I'm about to say to you for the next 30 minutes until Dr. Pat cuts me off, uh, are my parents. So on the bottom right, you see a picture of my mom who spent 31 years as an elementary school teacher. Fourth, fifth, sixth grade repeat for 31 years. So education was a priority for me. Education was taught to be the key to opportunity. I had no excuse if I brought home anything less than an A. And if I did, then I had to justify that no one got an A. And that's why I didn't get an A. But my mom pushed me, still scared of her to this day. <laughs> my father in the upper right um, has a very interesting story and the more that I hear about him and the more I read about him the more I realize how similar he and I are I'm the baby of three kids there's a 12 year gap I joked last night that I was a surprise but look what they got um, but the story of my dad actually is well summarized in this article. Now, unfortunately, he passed away a few months ago. Right after he passed away, the plethora of ESPN articles and phone calls and Washington Post, etc., happened, but this article stood out to me. So this is how Charlie Taylor almost became a Dallas Cowboys. So my dad played for Washington. So if you understand the rivalry, this article should bother you. This is blasphemy. Well, you know, how did this happen? And so my dad in the early years, uh, grew up in a town called Grand Prairie, right outside of Dallas, Texas. That's him on the bottom row to the right. At the time, it was a segregated area. So it was an all-black high school. He was a triathlete, just wonderful all around, but was only being recruited by black colleges. The SEC at the time was still segregated. White colleges were not recruiting him, and if they were thinking about it, they certainly weren't offering scholarships. So while he was being offered full rides to historically black, now called historically black colleges, that was not what he wanted to do. His mom is quoted as saying, my grandmother, he wanted to broaden his options so he could prove he could play against any competition. That resonates with me even today. And so what happened? Well, 
the story goes, I used to tell the story to myself and my husband. I used to think, dad, is that really true? Well, it's true. There's a white grocer in his hometown who knew him. And this grocer went with his mother to the Dallas front office. So that's what we would call today allyship. So in the front office and met with Gil Brandt. Gil Brandt was the VP of personnel for Dallas at the time. My grandmother, my dad's mother said, I have tape, film of my son. I want you to watch it and tell me how good you think he is. Now, coincidentally, sitting across from Gil Brandt at the time was one of the coaches from Arizona State. So the coach takes dad's film, goes into this office, makes a phone call, and comes out and says, ma'am, your son has a full ride to Arizona State. That's what we today call sponsorship. But dad wasn't even there, but he was there. So he goes to Arizona State, meets my mom, knocks it out of the park, gets recruited to the NFL. And the interesting part of the story, the whole point of this article was the deal was Charlie will come back to Dallas and be a cowboy. That's what he wanted to do. But that season, Washington and Dallas were tied with a three and eight record. Sounds kind of familiar to today. Uh, and so they flipped a coin to see who was going to get the first round number three draft pick in Washington won the coin toss. And they picked my dad. And so he goes on to become NFL Rookie of the Year in 1964, inducted into the Hall of Fame 1984. I was three and spent 30 years with the organization as a player for 13 seasons, then a coach for the rest of the time. So what I'm showing you is this idea of when students reach out to you, when residents are struggling, when junior faculty want to get promoted, and they ask for a phone call, you might think it doesn't matter. You might think these little things showing up, sponsorship, being an ally, it may not work out to become anything, but I often <laughs> remark, what if someone had not made a phone call for my dad? Where would I be today? Where would my children be today? What would their opportunities look like? And so nothing else, remember that everything that we do, everything you all do matters, and the domino effect may not show up for a while, which is antithetical to what orthopedic surgeons like. We like that instant gratification. What works, show me the results, show me an x-ray. I want to feel it, touch it, see it. But it's not necessarily going to happen that way when we talk about advancing health equity. And so this is me, and here are my allies and my sponsors and my mentors. One thing you should note is they don't match my identity completely, and that's powerful as well. So the point of today is this visual. So how do we get here? It's September 2022. 20 years ago, would we have talked about this? Probably not, maybe not to this magnitude or depth. But if you look at these images, which are real images, this is how we got here. Interestingly, I did my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, spent some time at Lutheran Hospital. This is not a picture from the locker room there. This is from the web, but this is what was on the uh, locker rooms when I was a fellow, except it didn't say doctor's locker, it said surgeon's lockers. And then next to it was a women's locker. And so this is 2012, 2013. Now I knew my place, I knew where I belonged. I knew Dr. Sykes was gonna go in here. I was gonna go in there. But these are images that actually perpetuate some of the issues we are struggling with today. So I had a great time in business school. Uh, Dr. Spector, Leo Spector was a classmate, a section mate, a teammate of mine. We go, we, we go back to those days of getting to know our own leadership styles and how to solve complex problems. One thing that resonates with me as a business minded person, as many of you are as well, is this idea that there's a business case for the work that we do. Diversity makes business better. Their economic benefits, many of you may have heard of that, increased revenue, innovation, employee engagement, commitment, productivity. This stems from a McKinsey article that showed outpaced financial performance from companies that had more heterogeneity in their employee base compared to those who did not. This is a friend of mine, Scott Page. He's not a physician. He's a mathematician and an economist at the University of Michigan but wrote this very awesome book called The Diversity Bonus. In it, he says we need to move away from the feel-good metaphorical of DEI and more to science. There are mathematical 
benefits from solving complex problems like healthcare when your team is heterogeneous. The counterpoint to this is that when you propose a business case for diversity, you are ultimately saying your motivation is to increase your company's financial bottom line. This is distinct from the fairness case, which relies on equal opportunity and the moral argument. Now, this is a study that was done. It's the actual study itself is about 40 pages long. So access it at your own risk if you have time, but there's a short version in HBR <laughs> that's like three pages. But what they did was they went through using an algorithm, the Fortune 500 companies. Now, a lot of what we do in healthcare is mirroring what is happening in corporate America. So to say the two things are different, it's not necessarily true anymore. And they found that about 80% of companies on their websites, their outreach to employees use a business case. We want you, we want diversity. It makes us better. It makes us more productive. We outperform our competitors. A little less than 5% used the fairness case. And then the rest either did not list anything about diversity or stated we believe in diversity period without justification. So, so what, what's the point of this? Well, what they found is that members of underrepresented groups in said industry, whether it was women, people of color, et cetera, were actually less likely to feel included when the business case was used in the messaging. So Dr. Bates may know this, but I, I run an organization that dives into the how-to and the intricacies, Dr. Dingle as well, of how to do this work. And one of the things we talk about is communication. How do you talk about it in decision-making groups and also with your target audiences? So if you use a business case, while well, you think it's attractive and meaningful, we need you, we need to match our patient population, it's going to make us grow, make us better, it can actually cause your target audience to feel as if they are just there because of their identity. To summarize it, why this is backfire, it also can make people feel like their identity is interchangeable. So if I am the only woman in a room and I'm there because we need a woman at the table because we're gonna make better decisions, and then another woman's coming up behind me, maybe I feel like, well, they're just gonna swap us. There's only one spot. Now, if you know me, you do know I never drop anything without some sort of solution. And so when you look at the articles, they do have recommendations for leaders. And one of the things that really resonates with me is to move away from this add diversity and stir mentality, but rather have leadership be willing to harness why is it important to have these different perspectives, these different backgrounds, and then reshape the power structure. And so the framework I use when I do work at Duke or do work abroad is self, system, and strategy. I think Dr. Scale and Dr. Pat have heard me talk about this before. But self, understanding how identity plays into the system, understanding your org structure, how that can hinder or help progress. And lastly, the strategy, how to execute on all the promises that are being made. So when you talk about identity, I could use any lens of diversity for this, but we have a significant amount of literature for race. So for the sake of time, I'm going to stick to the lens of race plus or minus gender a little bit later on. But we know this. This is not a surprise. I'm making a huge assumption. I'm not the first person who's talked to this group about this, and this is not the first time you've heard about this topic. This is from what used to be called the Institute of Medicine over 20 years ago. And they did this deep dive. Now, this document is 80 pages, so some good nighttime reading. But they went into why it's important to pay attention to this idea of health inequity, because it kills people. And because it kills people, it doesn't inconvenience them. It doesn't just make them feel bad. It actually causes death. It should be considered unacceptable. It should be on the level of our intolerance for anything else that causes harm and death to humans. What they found, though, was while we would like to say, well, there's a distrust of the medical system, so it's clinical appropriateness and patient choice that leads to the gap, it was actually social factors, biases, what we would now call implicit or explicit microaggressions that led to this gap. So their recommendation was increase the proportion, and this is in 2001, increase the proportion of U.S. students who uh, are 
in med schools, it will become physicians, and then we'll decrease this gap almost in a passive way. Now it's the National Academies of Medicine. This is a report from two years ago, exact same recommendation. So one would say, okay, it sounds important, but I'm not convinced. Well, okay, let's talk to our colleagues at ACS. So they reported this a few years ago. All of these benefits for diversity in healthcare. I'm still not moved. If you're not moved, the US News and World Report will help you be moved. Because now they have these rankings of programs, which yes, they're not perfect. But now they have a category on how is a certain center doing with health equity. Now, just like you can find these rankings, you can also find articles, papers, best practices. So with all that, how are we doing these last 20 plus years since our Institute of Medicine at the time shared this report? This is a study uh, that looked at applicants and matriculants to US medical schools over about 15 years or so. And they use something called the RQ, which is a representation quotient. So as you can infer, if the population is a direct match proportionately uh, in med school, that's an RQ of one. If the RQ is above one, it's considered overrepresentation. If it's below, it's underrepresentation. So despite pipeline programs, marketing campaigns, it's important. The Medicine Institute says it is. We believe in it. We want to do it. This is the way to do it. We still have these flat lines. Looks very similar in orthopedic surgery as well. There are threats to inclusion that happen even after you get in, even after you match, even after you get your first job, even after you start your own practice. This is a qualitative article. I think they are as valuable as the quantitative ones that looked at women surgeons' experiences and how they interacted with other women who were not surgeons. So your scrub techs, your circulators, your anesthetists, et cetera. And what they found was there was a double standard of how women were reported for executing the same behavior their male surgeons executed. This is important, and so I put it in green, and I want to reiterate this as much as I can. Despite what I'm about to show you of their experiences, they did not perceive malicious intent on the perpetrators. Rather said this is a symptom of a larger societal issue. So we're in a phase where we're afraid to say something wrong, we're afraid to get judged, for anyone who is championing this work or allying this work, remember the principle of grace. And that's what these women surgeons did. And so what they reported, I almost could have written this myself, but I promise you, these are not my quotes. But here's one, and you know, feel free to you know, do a uh, ah, if you can resonate with this. Fun fact, when I was a resident uh, in fracture conference and someone showed like this terrible periprosthetic fracture, I was known to be in the front row with a mm, that looks bad. And so I almost felt like I was in church. So that was, that's what I'm known for at UVA. <laughs> but here's one of the quotes. So guys tend to do a lot of ranting and yelling and throwing things. And it's just like completely ignored. I don't get that. I know some attendees here that got into a fist fight once and I don't think anybody got sent to a life coach, right? It's just stunning to me. I think for women, if you get upset or react, you're considered emotional or reactionary. Whereas if a man does it, they're being assertive or advocating for their patient. This is the last one I'll read to you. And then I was stunned at the end of the meeting when he told me he understood that, yes, sometimes men and women who may say the exact same thing in the exact same tone, we may be perceived differently. I was very happy to hear him acknowledge that, but in the very next breath, he said, maybe you would like to pursue some coaching to help with the way people perceive you. I didn't hear any, mm, uh, any no, nothing, okay. We'll talk about it after. So we don't have to share, I don't even think we have time to share, but I invite you to consider one aspect or two aspects of your identity that influence your health care experience. What parts of your identity actually make it hard for you to receive care or deliver care? What parts are strengths and assets? And so that's just a reflection question from this. And we'll move on to what I want to spend the most of the time on the next 10 minutes is system. So environment matters. Now, I've learned over the years to announce this before I show this. This is a trigger alert, okay? And I'm going to show you something 
And what I'd like you to think about is what your initial reaction is, what themes are coming into play, what are the implications of the decision that I'm about to show you, and what would you have done if you received a letter from an employer like this? So this was sent to me, I'll read it to you because it's old from 1952. This was sent to me by a colleague whose dad served in our military. He did his intern here in surgery, was drafted, went overseas, fought for our country, and then came back to begin residency. So dear Dr. So-and-so, thank you for your recent application for an assistant residency in surgery in the People's Hospital beginning July 1st, 1953. People's Hospitals never had a Negro as a member of our house staff, even though we recognize the importance of making facilities available to your race. As, oops, sorry, at present, we are working on a plan to integrate Negroes into our house staff and have discussed this with various community leaders. We are extremely anxious about this program that it succeed. And in view of the fact that we prefer to make promotions from within our institution, it was agreed by all interested parties that it would be better to start the first Negro People's Hospital as an intern and promote him as merited. We realize this does not meet your needs for residency training at the present time, but felt that you might be interested in knowing that more and more hospitals are recognizing their obligations to members of minority groups. So I um, showed this to a group of business school students. I have a faculty appointment at Fugua and I teach there every so often. Um, and some of the themes, you know, I let them sit there with it for a few minutes that came out were relevant to what we face today. Fear of the unknown, so you're going to be the first we're going to make sure the first one's going to be successful we're not sure if that's going to happen promoting within don't worry other people are going to take care of this for you down the street we recognize it's important but we're just not ready for you so people will say erica your hand surgeon went through 15 years after you know high school of training you've been in practice why do you still do this why is this intriguing to you why is this important it's because of this. If you think structural issues don't exist, I would ask how many of you know someone who was alive in 1952? How many of you are related to someone who was alive in 1952? It was 70 years ago. How many of you were born and alive in 1952? You don't have to raise your hand to say that. But this is not that long ago. In fact, some of this is still present. The only of today is that we have learned not to put it in writing but it still shows up it shows up in residency recruitment and selection it shows up in faculty advancement it shows up in clinical care delivery how patients choose us how we get resources and so that's why i really threw myself into the whole of this work because it's exciting challenging complex sometimes hurtful but it is amazing and so if we look at what health systems across the board, not just at Duke, not just academic, but really everyone is looking at, here's a list. The question I always ask, Dr. Mormon and I were talking about this alignment thing that's happening, but are we doing this work aligned? So one thing I learned a lot about in business school was about org structure. Now, this is an article from 2008. So all of these institutions may have restructured just like Duke is restructuring. But for those who are not familiar with the intricacies and nuances of academic centers, this is a spectrum from a fully integrated side on your right, where the health system, school of medicine, physician practice are one united front, one entity, to all the way on the left, where they're independent units. And if I had to guess which one does Duke most look like in its current form, it's this where we have a physician practice. And then we have a health system, Duke Health and the School of Medicine that have more of an integrative structure. And then there's these contractual agreements with the physician practice. So what's the so what of that? Well, when it comes to DEI work, this is actually a problem. So I broke this down. This is actually, I don't know if Dr. Spector is logged in. This is actually my thesis for business school 
is digging into Duke's DEI structure. And this could be applied to many other institutions. And what we found was that if you look at the university, which has a president, the School of Medicine has a dean, the physician organization has a president, the health system has a chancellor, the way DEI is structured and implemented is distinct. The problem is those focus areas on the bottom overlap. So university pushes out something that's for staff and students and faculty. Well, School of Medicine pushes out something that's for medical students and faculty. The health system pushes something out to deliver better care to our consumers, i.e. patients. But the physician organization, we want to do that too. So if at the end of the day, you are a resident and something happens to you, who is responsible for that? Well, it depends on what facility you were in. It depends on your employment contract. Uh, depends on if that entity has someone who can address it. If not, they may jaywalk across the street and have you go talk to someone else that you don't even know. And that's the struggle. And if I summarize what this looks like in terms of barriers, looks like redundancy, looks like a lack of coordination. In any leadership focus area, this is a disaster. This is what we would call a burning platform. Just so happens that when you look at it from a DEI standpoint, we're still moving from it being volunteerism and charitable giving to an actual business division. But that's what I have pushed for and what we have achieved at Duke is for it to be elevated to the magnitude of the respect and the value that it deserves. And so I'll spare you all the details of how I address this and fix this, but the most important take home is the first thing I had to do. I looked around and I saw all the deans at Duke meet, all the chairs at Duke meet, all the division chiefs at Duke meet, why not have all the different senior DEI leaders at Duke meet? Now I had one condition, you had to be second in command to the head of the entity. So you could not be four legs down on the totem pole. Your direct report had to be the president, dean, chancellor, or the other president. And this is what that group looks like. We meet monthly, we may share some identities, but we are different people. We do not agree all the time. We have different leadership styles. We have different communication styles. And that is exactly what I wanted. Because if we all agree, then you risk groupthink and then nothing gets done because we're just trying to be friends. But here we're trying to make sure the work we do aligns, that we're aware that we support endeavors and that we consolidate. We probably actually saved our enterprise money because we haven't hired a bunch of FTEs. We've shared them. And so as you reflect on the system part, and we're about to finish with the last section on strategy, I'm curious, whatever your identity is, whether it's Atrium, Wake Forest, Ortho Carolina, a combination, I know it's complicated. Do you all use the business case, the fairness case, the neutral case, when you discuss DEI, not just when you recruit, but also when you're in these decision-making groups? Also, what are strengths or opportunities to the approaches you've taken? And then how does your structure either support or hinder your work? There's a huge, um, very widely published concept that DEI leaders, for example, are asked to do this work as if it's volunteerism. If nothing else, what I presented shows you this is tricky. It should be resourced, i.e. compensated, protected, and supported in the way we would support me and my role as chief of ortho for Duke Raleigh Hospital, or my role as a vice chair in our department. That's a phenomenon I'm working on that I'm stomping for and I'm advocating for, but if you want this to be sustainably done, the resources have to be provided without question. So last but not least, strategy, and this is where I hope you walk away with one thing that maybe you could implement or pull from here. And <laughs> the first thing is, well, how do you create a strategy? So I don't know if any of you have heard about this, it's called the JK Method. I just learned about it two months ago. It blew my mind. And now I'm over-promising because you're going to be like, it wasn't really that great. But <laughs> it blew my mind because as a physician, I don't usually think this way. So for the physician organization, there is a DEI committee. It predates even my role as the head of DEI for the physician org. So they've been in existence. The best part is there are no physicians on it. I actually think that's healthy. Probably they get stuff done a little bit quicker. But they brought this idea of let's have this big team try to turn ideas that seem like chaos into strategy. So here's how it goes. I'll go through this quickly. You take your team in a room. Now you can do this with any topic. We just happen to do it with DEI. And you ask a question in silence. What is 
the ideal, optimal, inclusive, equitable, diverse Duke health. One sentence per post-it. You give people about 20 minutes. There is a group we came up with 150 one-liners. Again, no one's talking to each other. And the next thing you do, this is just a part of the team, is you go up to a whiteboard and you put it on. No one's talking. Then you go around, you can take a selfie if you'd like. And then you take the post-its. And if you wrote down pay equity, someone else wrote down compensation equity. That sounds similar. So you take it and you group it. That's called the affinity diagram. Again, no one's talking. But at the end, you have these clusters. And then as a group, you can now speak and say, okay, this looks like pay equity. Let's call it that. This cluster looks like accountability. Let's call it that. This cluster looks like recruitment. Let's call it that. So that took about two hours. Then we took a break for a week, came back together. Hi, how are you? Haven't seen you in a week. Ooh, we're all refreshed. And we took those 17 categories and put them on a board. I'll blow this up for you in a second. But the goal was then to go from each category to another and determine which direction an arrow would flow, what drives, what receives. What comes first, your mission strategy category or your investment category? And so we started doing that. That took like five minutes. I'm like, we're almost done. But then I realized, no, you have, to, you have to do it for each combination. This is where combinations, permutations comes into play. And it takes a while. This cobweb gets a little bit intricate. But the fortunate thing is it doesn't actually matter. You have to have fun while you do this what is in the middle. What matters is what had arrows going to and what had arrows going away. So let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Here are the 17 categories. So let me be clear. We created this. This was not handed to us from McKinsey or Deloitte. This was something that was homegrown, ingrown. Therefore, it represents our voices. Therefore, we're inextricably linked to this because we thought of these things. So if you look at this list in order of driver, what we spend most of the time, particularly in orthopedics doing, is recruitment and retention. Who have you recruited? Who have you retained? Recruitment, retain, what are our numbers? Recruit, we need to recruit, pipeline, recruit, recruit. Ah, oh, this person's leaving, now our numbers are off, let's go back and recruit again. But if you look at this and you focus on that column called driver, it's actually at the bottom. Now, this is not a priority or an importance list. This is a driver receiver. The take home is that if you focus on receivers more than the top seven or so drivers, you will spend 20 years doing this work and wondering why you haven't made any difference. Why do people come, but then they leave? Why do people come, but then they're miserable? Why is there still a wage gap? Why are people still not feeling belonging? So what we do with this exercise is we say, all right, we still will do recruitment and retention. That's important. It's a thing called parallel processing. It's like when I tell the room, just because the patient is on the way does not mean you can also, you don't also have to start opening the train. Like you, you know, we can do two things at once to get the case to start on time. Um, but strategy, data, leadership training, et cetera, are things that are often not talked about because they're often not uncovered until you do an exercise like that. And so last but not least, some tactical examples. Some of you may have heard this before, but we added a patient experience demographic builder. So we all know Press Gainey, we know it, we love it. <laughs> That's sarcasm. But we now added to the dashboard a filter by demographic identity that any provider or any division chief or any clinical medical director could log in any chair and see how their different areas are doing. Now you have to also understand this is a demo of what a report would look like there's a gap in terms of who fills out surveys. So you have to do your own statistical significance with that. And you also have to understand the implications of having a filter. For example, if I am a male physician and someone says, oh, just so you know, women think you don't communicate to them clearly, one unintended consequence could be, oh my goodness, I must be sexist. No, 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 no. That's not what that means. Another unintended consequence would be, well, if they don't like me and my bonus is linked to my CG caps and I'm just going to have all my female partners see all the female patients. We don't want that either. This is a tool to identify if there are any equity gaps in a certain clinical area that we can improve upon and also understand the bi-directional biases that can actually happen from patient to provider. We also started standardizing our recruitment. So this is an idea, it's a theme called behavioral-based interview questions. So, you know, we are in this space where if you come and interview at Duke for a foot and ankle job, for example, 
you will meet with probably eight people virtually now and we'll ask you, so where'd you train? Oh, do you know Bruce Cohen? Oh yeah, I did it with him one night at Capitol Grill. He's great. Oh, president of, you know, AOFAS. But at the end of the day, have I really asked about integrity, excellence, character, how they've worked with diverse teams? And then, you know, we hire someone and we wonder why there was this issue. So we've standardized this process by really informing people of why search and selection committees should be informed and educated on bias. But most importantly, forget the DEI part, just standard questions that a committee head can assign, not to replace, but to complement the natural human connection. So it's not to take away from where do you like to go on vacation, that's important. It's to add some teeth and some standardization to what you ask. And so we're actually working on creating a video version of this that will hold onto our learning management system so that I don't have to go to every clinical department. There's 200 searches at Duke right now. Anyone wants a job, talk to me after. Uh, but it is to make this easily accessible so that any search committee could just log in, watch it, and learn these questions. Speaking of the learning management system, we also did a deep dive into how many educational trainings that have to do with these 25 keywords, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, identity, gender, et cetera, do we have? Between 2001 and last year, we actually found that we have 90 courses. Funny though, it's actually 89 because one of these is called identity theft, which <laughs> happened to me, so I probably should have taken that course. But so it's 89. And you can track how many employees have taken said courses over what time course. If you want to be more specific to the last year, you can cut by that. This is not a solution, but it's a tool. It's a tool to help create strategy. So there's courses that were hits. Let's find out why they were hits. Why did 20,000 employees take that? Oh, it's because we made it mandatory. Okay, well, let's see if that was actually worthwhile. Let's do some post hoc feedback. If there were courses that only seven people took out of 30 plus thousand employees, well, it doesn't mean it was a terrible course. Maybe we didn't communicate about it. So this is a tool to help create strategy. And then true color advantages goes without saying, um, I will tell you this, the co-founder down here adopted two black sons when they were young. Dr. Bates should know about this. They got onto all these like cuts and bruises and things like that. And this something on a bandaid and dad was like, this looks terrible. I'm going to create a line that looks like you. And so we started using them at Duke. We did it in our pop-up vaccine clinics in the communities that were mostly minority. We used them for our employee vaccine clinic. Um, patients would say things like, finally. Leave it up to Duke to take this step. It's about time, the four-year-old patient, I like it because it looks like my skin. And when this went viral in 2019, I, incidentally, the, co, the other co-founder is a hand surgeon, um, Raymond Rarupa, so that was a connection. But this professor said uh, in that second tweet, the clear one looks like this on me. It's a white patch in the middle, but honestly, if you're focusing on the Band-Aid, you missed the point. It's not about an exact skin match. It's about belonging racial inclusion, it's not about the band-aid. So take home points here. Hopefully you have seen these, um, but I do need to make an acknowledgement and that is to this guy. Um, this is him with his quarterback, Sonny Jurgensen. We all need allies. We all need people who have our bet and who pass the ball to us to help us be great. And if you think about the Washington football team now called the Washington Commanders, they are not known for their DEI achievements. <laughs> <laughs> so they were actually the last team in the NFL to integrate. And they did so by force. The owner did not want black players. The commissioner mandated that. They took Bobby Mitchell from the Cleveland Browns, put him on the team as the first black player. And my dad came right after. Bobby was my dad's mentor. Now they're both in heaven celebrating and playing together. But imagine what it was like in 1964 for my dad to be in that environment. The songs people would sing to him when he ran up on the field. My dad, quiet guy, has a bit of a temper. Bobby would say, Charlie, just fall back, just play hard. Despite what he went through, being underpaid until he won work of the year, then they doubled his salary and gave him an extra 10,000. I was like, oh, dad, if you were two generations later, I would be on a yacht somewhere. <laughs> Despite that, he says in his Hall of Fame speech, and it's so funny, my dad's very quiet. I did not inherit that gene from him. But one thing he said, and it's touted as being one of the shortest Hall of Fame acceptance speeches, is, uh, speeches was, I would like to say I had some of the greatest and most moral support that one player could have in a lifetime, and I had it in Washington. 
So what I leave with you is that, yes, this topic is hard. It can reveal experiences or micro trauma that are unpleasant, but there is beauty, learning, connection, and pride. So keep doing it. Thank you. This is my pride here, um, but I'm open to any questions. And yes, Josh, I ran out of time for the hot seat. So mission <laughs> Yeah, I'll start. So uh, first off, thank you. I thought that talk was uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, it's, it's always good to see what others are doing. And, uh, you know, I agree that this can be a challenging topic for various reasons. And the part where you ask us to reflect, you know, is it an internal motivator, is it an external motivator? Do we, do we make the business case? Do we make the morality case? So one question I had is, do you, do you think that there is a role for, for both? You know, my instinct tells me that that business case probably is an easier way to introduce the topic sometimes. And, and maybe that's why we see it. I think your slides at 80 percent of the time. Okay. Do you think that is a fallacy or you should not even fall victim to using that as an introductory method? Or should you just completely focus on the, you know, the morality case instead of the business case? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, one thing when I go to different groups is I say, well, your environment's going to warrant something different. And even the meeting you're in is going to warrant something different, which is why I love being able to pivot. Um, you know, one preacher I follow says, you have to be able to preach to like Pookie, who just got out of jail, as well as the attorney or the NBA player in your congregation. You got to be able to sort of segue between what your audience needs to hear. So there are some times where if they're still in that 1952 letter mentality, Yes, bring some business case with you to the meeting if they're going to make a decision about hiring processes or compensation model. But when you're in front of a candidate, and I got this question at the women's conference yesterday, and you say, we need to diversify our leadership. This woman, for example's perspective is awesome, cautionarily convey that, but not in a case that when you come here, we expect you to make miracles happen, because that's unfair. Find why your group, your position, the unit needs a different perspective and then convey that. So it's your communication to recruits is going to be different in some cases to garnering resources. And you have to be able to do this enough, have enough of those conversations. I'm very fortunate to be on a few boards at Duke to be in levels where I can learn the dynamics and then pivot when I need to. Um, but it's, it's a spectrum. And so I would say learn how to do both when it's appropriate. I was really surprised by the, the idea that the business case can actually backfire and it's very interesting. In medicine, we often get a case that's not maybe either the business or the moral, but the patient outcome case. Mm -hmm. Patient safety, patient outcomes, you mentioned death with, with um, healthcare inequities. Do you think that is experienced as a business case or as a moral case to providers? Because ultimately, if you get that patient outcome case, it's still not about the physicians yep. and the uh, members of underrepresented minorities who come to the table. It's still about other people and sort of a productivity, even though it's not, even if it's not financial. What do you think? No, that's a great point. And so one thing that I realized uh, when people ask me why I went the business route is because the decision makers, for the most part, never touched a patient before. So for those, we used to call them gatekeepers saying that this is going to make my you know joint replacement outcome better yeah okay well you're still going to do joints we're still going to get that value for it but then introduce value-based care introduce bundle payments introduce two-tailed risk models and then you can start talking about the business case and why we don't just need to have more female surgeons or more black surgeons or more surgeons who identify with a different gender or sexual orientation or identity we actually need to have a more heterogeneous group so we treat each other better, understand connection, and can cross-culturally connect with patients. And yes, if they were to do that, then more patients would be attracted to our enterprise or our practice, and then it would increase the financial bottom line. But you, you know, will struggle not doing the business case if the majority of the decision makers don't understand the patient ethical dilemma that we encounter every day. I'm growing. <laughs> 
Yes, Dr. Mormon. Erica, thank, thanks for your presentation. Those of us who've seen you grow, grow up are very proud of you and what thank you've done. Um, I, I don't want to talk about the business case so much, but I do have a business question for you. Yes. Um, when you're developing your work chart and assigning um, resources to the team that's put together to work in this area, for a physician leader in a department, what percentage of an FTE would you all assign it to, to DEI work? Yeah, uh, that is one of my favorite questions because it's an evolution. And so I I will share my two identities. So for five years, I've been a, what was called a DEI committee leader for my department is now a vice chair role. When I started it, our chair said, Erica, I want to propose something to you. I think you'd be great. The person who served before you, I don't think her heart's in it. You seem to really be passionate. Just so you know, there's no pay, no protected time, no committee and no strategic plan. But I know you'd be great. <laughs> it wasn't wrong because the mindset was well let me take this and now I have no predecessor no precedent I can create whatever and if you're a creative minded person that's very attractive to you but then after about a year or so you realize that other people who are leading or other people who are vice chairs have a staff assistant they have time carved out Maybe they're on a comp model that's not a whole wholly reliant on revenue like I am. And that's when you need to have the conversation of best practices for sustainable DEI work. And I had a couple conversations with my chair, and he will probably deny ever saying this. But the first time I asked for resources and protected time, he said, DEI work doesn't take that much work. I mean, you run a few events, that's pretty much it. I said, okay, I respectfully disagree. But what it caused me to do was to go back to what Dr. Bates and you raised was, let me make this business case to him. In fact, let me not make it to him, let me make it to the dean. And wouldn't you know, three weeks later, hey, Eric, I thought about what you said to me. You know what, we're going to give you a good stipend for this. And I didn't, you know, I acted surprised, but I knew that it was now a school that was a mandate to, to resource your vice chairs. And so... The way that it's modeled now, they just revamped it literally a month ago at Duke School of Medicine, is that it's expected that at least 20% of your effort as a vice chair of DEI will be protected and backstopped in terms of equity. So 20% of a surgeon is different than 20% of a family doc. Family docs have an issue with that, but hey, we all made choices. And so, but 20% a day per week is what is had it now personally for me and the way I function and the efficiency of how I do work, I don't need a day per week. In fact, I would never ask for a day per week. A day per week for me is very expensive. I would negotiate that to 10%. I'd be fine with that. But that's because I've learned how to work efficiently in this space. But someone starting out would like to need a full day per week protected, especially if you infiltrate your system with that person. So they're not just having a DEI committee meeting, but you want them to be at your resident selection meeting. You want them to be at your department leadership meeting. You want them to sit with your strategic planning community. You want to talk about how to deliver care equitably in this area, and they need to meet with pop health, population health. Then that day per week is important so that you do not lead to a case where you are preaching one thing, but then treating your leaders differently. Now, from a physician organization, the other hat I wear they protect 50% of my time. That started as 30%. And when I interviewed for that role, I said, they, oh, do you have any questions? I said, yes. What is the cadence of when you and I will meet again if I were to get this to reevaluate resources? This is a inaugural role. You don't know what you don't know. Oh, of course, Erica, like every year, we'll reevaluate it. And if you need more time, we'll, you'll get you more time. And so three months in, I realized that that role needed to happen because my inbox was full of meeting invitations. Oh, we finally have someone who could help with this clinical issue, someone who could help with this patient care issue in the ambulatory sector or in the ASCs. And so three months in, I went back and I asked for more. And within a day, they approved it. But it was because from a leadership strategy, every month, I emailed the summary of what I did. That's true for any role you're in, especially if it's a novel role, a new role. Let your leaders know what you're doing. Let them know what's happening so that they look good. There's nothing to be gained by making leadership look bad or keeping them ill-informed. I would have meetings with President Price or Daniel Ennis, who was the VP. 
I made sure my physician organization knew what those discussions were so that if they were in some meeting I never knew existed and Daniel Ennis, our VP said, hey, John Sampson, our physician org president, yeah, Eric was in this meeting about the certificate we're gonna roll out across the enterprise. He actually knows what they're talking about. It's a win all around. And so for that particular role, that's 50% of my time. Um, but I still have two days in the OR, two days in clinic per week. Um, like I said, I end my OR pretty early. So I did just five cases on Friday, but finished at 1030 in the morning. And then the rest of the day, I could do things that are relevant to any of the roles that I do. I also would say, even though there's a lot of different titles, it's actually the same job. I said this last night to Dr. Cohen, the chief of ortho job at Duke Raleigh and the DEI job for the organization are identical. It's a group of people who feel like they're not valued, who feel like they're not heard, who need representation, communication, they need to speak truth to power, they need to understand the organization and processes. So I don't have to change who I am. The only difference is who's on the other side of the Zoom or who's sitting at the table with me. Okay. Well, email me if you have any other questions. Um, one thing I have to say, we did go to Spain. Erica, aka Houdini, is gone. But um, <laughs> we went to Spain with the Duke Hand Society a few weeks ago. And this is from the bottom left is the fishing trip. So even though I didn't catch the biggest fish, I certainly had the biggest hat on. Um, <laughs> and so these are my identical twins on their birthday, which is 2-22-22 this year, Tuesday. And my five-year-old. Um, my son, I took to the Duke game this past weekend, um, who loved every minute of it. And then some of the amazing surgeons I know, Shana Lipa and Alexis Gaskin, and then two of the residents who are members of our um, ODLC organization. So thank you for inviting me, and hopefully I'll be back.